Happy Easter. Man, low in the grave they lay. <laughs> Happy Easter. Thank you. Um, we're in Eastertide. Did you grow up with Eastertide? I, I did not grow up with Eastertide. And I was reading, uh, getting ready for this time of the year, uh, one of my favorite authors, and he said, these weeks after Easter ought to be the most joyful, the most celebratory, the most life-giving weeks of our life. We've seen that Jesus is raised from the dead. We've caught the power of the resurrection. But we don't do enough with that. Easter Sunday comes and we uh, dress up and show up and eat up and then we move on. And yet Easter is the defining moment of the history of the whole world. The, the resurrection of Jesus is the beginning of the new creation. The, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the proof that your sins are forgiven. The, the resurrection of Jesus it's the final declaration that Jesus is the king. I, I, and we miss it. I, I think if we were to walk around with Jay Leno and do jaywalking and we were to ask people, what's the big event in Christianity? Most people would say Christmas. Because it's the big commercial event, right? Do you know we don't really know when Jesus was born? Like we picked December 25th because it works for a lot of reasons, but we don't. We just chose that day. And nobody would have gone to look for that date had it not been for Easter. So in the same way that we take four weeks to get ready for Christmas and we call that season Advent, I'd like to take these weeks after Easter and live into the truth and the power of the resurrection. And so what I'd like us to do this year is have the experience that the early church had. So week by week, we're going to look at the resurrection appearances of Jesus. We'll start this week with his appearance to Mary Magdalene. And next week, <coughs> excuse me, to the two fellows on the road to Emmaus. And then to Simon Peter. And then our youth are going to lead us. Then we'll stand with the disciples at the ascension. And then be there for Pentecost. I just want to walk through this experience together. So that we catch some of the wonder and the victory of Easter and the resurrection. And we let that joy and that victory wash over us like a fresh tide of God's grace. Easter tide. That's what we're going to do. Fair enough? Okay. I have a question for you this morning. How do you measure what you're worth? Do, do you have some calculus that you sort of keep track of that? Maybe it's your salary. And so at that time of the year when it happens in your company and you're trying to figure out uh, where do I rank on the cut sheet or uh, what am I getting or am I trying to figure out where I am relative to other folks? Or maybe it's your net worth. I know how much I have and I know how much I owe and I'm somewhere in there. Uh, if you ever want to, you could always just Google how much are the chemicals in my body worth. Um, this morning it was about a dollar. Uh, turns out God can do almost everything with almost nothing in you too. So how do you measure what you're worth? And the countervailing question is, how do you think God measures what you're worth? And the answer that I think you need to have is differently. God measures what we're worth not based on what we have, or what we do, God measures what we're worth based on who we are. And through the resurrection of Jesus from the grave, God declares that you are his beloved child. And because it comes from who you are, you can't lose that. What that means is that there's nothing you can do to, God, to cause God to love you more or to share more favor with you that's a gift that comes from God. It's not based on what you have or what you do. Richard Rohr says God loves us not because we're good, but because God is good. The other side of that is there is nothing that you can do that will cause God to love you less. His love for you comes out of who he is. It comes because of who you are. 
You can mar who you are, but you can't lose who you are. Wherever you go, whatever you do, it turns out you're going to go with you. And so the good news is God loves you for who you are. What I want us to do this morning is try to get a handle on that, try to get our grips on that by looking at what is genuinely one of the most amazing and beautiful <coughs> excuse me, and lovely stories in the whole scripture. It's the story of Jesus' first resurrection appearance. And you'll find it in the 20th chapter of John's Gospel. We're going to focus what we have to say on the last seven verses of this passage. But to get a sense of it, we're going to start in verse 1. So if you have a copy of the scripture, would you open it with me to John chapter 20. And beginning in verse 1. And there the scripture says. Very early, on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went down to the tomb, and she saw that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance to the tomb. So she ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and she said to them, they've taken the Lord's body from the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. They were running, but the other disciple outran Simon Peter, and he got to the tomb first. He bent over, and he looked inside, and he saw the strips of cloth, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived at the tomb and went in straightway, and he saw the strips of cloth and the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head, and it was folded neatly and was separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had gotten there first, came inside and he saw the strips of cloth and the burial cloth. He saw and he believed. Now they did not yet understand from the scripture that Jesus had to be raised from the dead. And then the disciples went to their homes. But Mary stood beside the tomb, crying. And while she was weeping, she bent over and looked inside and saw two angels dressed in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said, They've taken my Lord, and I don't know where they've put him. And at this, she turned her head and saw Jesus was behind her, but she didn't know that it was Jesus. And he said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who is it that you came looking for? And thinking that he was the gardener, she said, If you've taken his body, tell me where you've put him, and I'll go get him. And he said to her, Mary... And turning full round, she saw him, and she called out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means my teacher. And Jesus said to her, don't hold on to me, for I've not yet returned to the Father. Instead, go and tell my brothers that I'm going to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. And Mary went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them all of these things that he said to her. This is the word of the Lord. I've always loved this passage. Part of it is the, the mixture of the pathos and, and the comedy in the passage. You know, this is written by John, who's the beloved disciple, right? He's being gracious about that. And at the time, he's the youngest of the disciples. At the time of the resurrection, about 18 years old. And he runs to the tomb with Simon Peter, who's probably the oldest of the disciples. We think that because he's their leader. So the way he tells that story, it'd be like if I were running with Drew Barkley or Andrew Corbin, who both run, you know, cross-country track. He says, they were both running, but I beat the old guy there and just had to stand and wait for him because I needed to give deference to him. And I looked in. But then he ran in and saw the whole scene, couldn't make heads or tails of it, and then I came in and I understood Jesus had been raised, and then we went home. 
what? So there's this really kind of funny comedic exchange between Simon, Peter, and John. And then they leave. And there's Mary. And that's when the action starts. And I, I, I wonder, why did Jesus appear to Mary Magdalene? Do you ever wonder that? Mary Magdalene doesn't feature prominently in John's gospel at all. In fact, the first time we see her is when she appears at the foot of the cross with the other women. John doesn't tell us anything about her at all. What little we know about Mary Magdalene, we have to learn from the other gospels. So why? Now, her place is spectacular here. Did you catch all that? She is the first apostle. If the definition of an apostle is someone who has seen the risen Christ, she's the first apostle. And not only that, she is the apostle to the apostles. Jesus says, go to my brothers and tell them. And John says, John said, and she carried the news, the good news, the gospel. She's the apostle to the apostles. She is the first to see and have conversation with the risen Lord Christ. And still I want to know. Why did Jesus make this first resurrection appearance to Mary Magdalene? I can tell you a lot of reasons that aren't the reason. He didn't appear to Mary Magdalene because it made any strategic sense. If you were trying to build a case in the first century for the resurrection of Jesus from the grave, you would not make a woman the star of the story, and if you did, you sure wouldn't make it Mary Magdalene. Right? There's no value in that. The book of Deuteronomy says if you're trying to establish testimony in a court of law, you have to have two witnesses. Mary Magdalene's by herself. We've wasted an appearance. You have to have two witnesses, and women's testimony is suspect versus men's testimony. So she can't even tell the story in a way that, that, that's uh, helpful in court. If you were trying to be, I'm just saying, if you were trying to be strategic in the way you did this, if you want maximum impact, from your first impression, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. If you want maximum impact from that, go to Caiaphas, right? Go to Herod. Go, go to Caesar. D don't open the door, just walk through it. <laughs> then pick something up off the desk and say, hey, there's a new king in town. <laughs> right? If, if you want to be strategic in the way you exercise these appearances, that's not what he's doing. He, he doesn't come to Mary Magdalene because she's the, she has the greatest faith among all the disciples. The, the text says she went to the tomb that morning and saw that the stone had been rolled away and then she went and got Simon, Peter, and John and told them they've taken the body out of the tomb. So presumably when she went she looked and she didn't see the body in the tomb and that's why she went and got Simon, Peter, and John. Remember when John came in the tomb when he saw that, his own testimony is he saw and he believed. He just put the, the, he connected the dots. Something about the way the headdress was folded neatly like the body just sort of got up out of it and left it behind and said, this isn't what happened to Lazarus. He saw and he believed. Mary didn't have that experience at the tomb. She didn't look in the tomb and put the dots together. In fact, being at the tomb... Uh, didn't even give her a hint of resurrection faith. It only made her more sad with the assumption that even the possibility of being close to the body had been taken away from her. Even when two angels show up to, to tell her the story, that doesn't bring her out of her grief. Even the voice of Jesus himself doesn't take her out of her grief until he calls her name. Jesus didn't come to Mary Magdalene because she had the greatest faith of all the disciples. And he didn't come, <coughs> Ooh, sorry, he didn't come because he didn't have any place else to go and no one else to see, right? The, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved and Simon Peter, the chief among the disciples, have both been right there in this very scene. The scripture says that Jesus is going to descend into hell to bring out the faithful. Jesus himself here says he needs to ascend to his father in order to do what is in front of him to do. 
He has all the world to save. He's got stuff on the to-do list. It wasn't that he had no place else to go. So why is it that Jesus takes his first resurrection appearance and he makes it here with Mary Magdalene? I don't know, but I can tell you what I think. I believe that Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene because she needed him the most. Early, on the first day of the week, while it was still dark. That's when she went to the tomb. Can you see her in that raven dark morning? Can you see her that morning? Has she been up all night long or has she been fitful and she just bolted out of bed before the sun came up and decided she had to go? Eyes red from weeping, bags under them exhausted from the strain and she has to go to be at the tomb. Some scholars say that she's going to finish the preparation of his body to complete the process for burial. But when she goes, what she's expecting to find is a stone sealed with the royal seal and guarded by Roman soldiers. She doesn't think she's getting in that tomb. Maybe she's just going to weep. Maybe she just wants to be closer to Jesus. Maybe she's going because there's no place else for her to be. There's no place else that matters. There's nothing else in life that matters now. And she just wants to be closer to Jesus. I believe Jesus came to Mary Magdalene because in all the world she needed him the most. Here is the one in whom all authority in heaven and on earth has been vested. Here is the one who has the power to bring God's kingdom. Here is the one who's going to save everyone. And what he tells us through Mary Magdalene is no one is beyond his love, beyond his grace, beyond his attention. In this case, the need of the one outweighs the needs of the many. And I think that's good news. Because what that means is when you have need of Jesus, he has time for you. When you have need of Jesus, he has time for you. That's still true today. Do you know that? I don't know how insignificant you think you are in the grander scheme of things, how big you see the world and how small you see yourself, but to God, you are worth the life of his son. To God, you are worth the time in his life every time you need him. That, that's the depth of what St. Augustine, the 4th century bishop of Hippo, meant when he said God loves all of us like God loves each of us. And God loves each of us like there was none other in all the world to love. I want to think about that with you this morning. God loves all of us like God loves each of us. Sometimes I think it's easier for us to construe God's love for the whole world than God's love for us because we know ourselves. God's love for the whole world we see, it shapes the whole gospel of John. It's the first verse of scripture most of us learn. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God didn't send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. The, we get that God loves the whole world. That, that's the arc of the scripture, that God created everything out of nothing, that God looked at what he created and he said, this is good, it's good, it's very, very good that we turned away from God, but God never turns away from us. And from the time of Abram forward, God has been working to redeem and to restore and to reclaim and to renew the whole creation and bring it back to himself. It's easier for us to believe that God loves the whole world. It's harder for us to believe that God loves just me or just you. But that's the other side of it, isn't it? 
God loves all of us like God loves each of us. And God loves each of us as if there was none other in all the world to love. My favorite biblical commentator is Tom Wright. He's a British pastor and scholar. Tom suggests that the way to understand this text is to choose to come and stand alongside Mary Magdalene in her weeping. So I'm going to ask you to do that this morning. I want you to picture in your mind this tomb. Can you see it? About 36 inches high, like a giant coin, the ceiling stone that has been rolled away from the tomb. And here's this carved out cave. And beside it is Mary Magdalene. Can you see her there on that first Easter Sunday morning? Go stand beside her in your mind's eye. Think of someone you know who's been weeping this week. Maybe it's someone you've seen on the news you don't know personally. Maybe it's someone who's very close to you. But bring them with you and the two of you stand beside Mary Magdalene at this tomb. Feel her tears. Bring yours. Don't rush the experience. Tears have a rhythm all their own. Can you hold that together? These people and these tears here at this tomb, standing there in your mind's eye. And when you're ready, bend over and look down inside the tomb. But be ready for the surprise. Where did the angels come from? They weren't there just a minute ago when Simon Peter and John ran into the tomb. They didn't see any angels. There weren't angels there then unless some scholars say you can only see angels through tears. That's why Mary saw them that day. Here they are. If you pay attention in the scripture, when angels show up and people are afraid, the angels tend to say, fear not. When angels show up and people are crying, the angels tend to ask, why are you crying? What tears do you bring to the tomb this day? Can you own that for yourself? They've taken away my, what is that? They've taken away my dream. They've taken away my husband, my child. They've taken away my house. They've taken away my job. They've taken away my rights, my dignity, my hope. Mary Magdalene at that tomb said, they've taken away my master. Do you feel the pain in that? In this moment, the the world's grief, Israel's grief, rests on the shoulders of Mary Magdalene. Now, As you're standing with Mary Magdalene with all of that grief concentrated here in this one spot, turn your head and can you see him standing just there? You can't quite make out who he is or what he's doing or why he's here. Mary Magdalene takes him to be the gardener, which is at the same time tragically comic and profoundly true. You see, this is the new creation and Jesus is the beginning of the new creation you can almost hear Pilate echoing again Ece Omo behold the man the new Adam the gardener here is the one who has been charged to bring order back into the chaos that has been become, become God's creation here is the one who's going to rip out the thorns and the thistles and bring blossom and harvest and beauty and life back into the creation Now listen, as he calls out her name, Mary, and can you hear in that one word an utterance that is at the same time greeting and consolation and gentle rebuke and invitation all rolled up into one? Mary, as if to say, don't you know me? Of course we know him. Of course we don't know him. He he is the same. He is the one who was just crucified and is now raised. And he is completely different. He is alive. 
And there is a life in him unlike anything anyone in the world has ever seen. Can you let him call your name? Can you let him call the name of anyone you would bring with you to that tomb on that day? Anyone who needs his love and his healing. And let your prayer flow to him. Because he is the one, the only one who can heal you, who can save you, who can restore you, who can make your life whole, and you need sozeste. As much as God loves the whole world, He loves just you. God loves all of us as God loves each of us. And God loves each of us as if there was none other in all the world to love. Amen? Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you that in our need for you, you have time for us. That with all of the things that you have to do to manage the restoring of creation, you're not too busy to come to us and to call us by name like the good shepherd knows to do for his sheep. God, we thank you that your love is greater than our sins, that your love reaches all the way to where we are, that we don't have to be the most strategic part of the plan or the most faithful ones along the way or the most important anything. We simply have to be your children who need you to merit your time. Help us to call out to you, to come to you, to cling to you, Because you are our God. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, How about you? When everything went wrong in Mary's life, when she went to the one place she thought she might find comfort and it wasn't there, she went to Peter and John. There was a family around her. Is there a place that you know to go where you can find life? Have you given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you received life from him? If you haven't, we invite you this morning to profess your faith in him and to receive the free gift of his life through his resurrection. Or maybe you're already a believer in Christ, but you don't have a church home. When it all goes wrong, there's not a people to whom you would run. And we'd be the family of God for you here in this place if you'll let us be. Or Maybe you've been counting it wrong. And you've thought yourself too insignificant. Not a strategic part of the plan. Not faithful enough. Not important enough. Not something enough. And you need to hear in Mary Magdalene, as much as God loves the whole world, He loves just you and has time for you. If you need to make a public decision or if you need someone to pray for you, there'll be a minister right here at the front. Can we all confess the greatest and deepest truth of our faith that Jesus loves us, and commit ourselves to him and to his kingdom, we stand together and sing.